we go to prayer. Aren't you grateful? So grateful today for the cross. As we get ready to gather for prayer, I trust that you've been to the potter's wheel, marred, broken, and he told Israel, I'll make you again a new vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. One little boy said, God, don't make no junk. And as we go to prayer, let's go thanking and praising and worshiping in spirit and in truth. So many that we need to remember in prayer, Betty uh, Ledman, still critical. And let's remember her as we pray. Reverend Pat McGue started dialysis, is that right? This week. So let's remember the McGue family. Fred and Carol Bowen, Brenda's dad and mom. Her dad is uh, a little bit better. He saw another doctor, and the doctor said, uh, he don't have dementia, he's got Alzheimer's. And they've got him on the wrong medication. And so he switched his medication, and he's been sleeping all night and, and um, not near as confused as he was before, so keep praying for uh, uh, Brenda's dad and mom. I could tell the difference in, in Brenda's mom's voice as she talked with Brenda. Uh, Marcy Sowers' son, Billy, he's at Cleveland Clinic facing some serious uh, procedures, and so let's remember him as we pray. Joella Bolin uh, and the Bolin family, they're just many, and I sense this morning in this service that there's many that are carrying burdens and maybe God has answered your prayer and maybe you have a prayer that you'd like to bring to him as we pray for his church and our nation and our families as the choir sings this little chorus again feel free to come this morning You have a prayer or a request. You've got a son, daughter, mother, father, husband, wife. Marriage.
let's bow our heads and pray together. Father, we thank you that we can worship you on this Sabbath day. Coming in Jesus' name, because of the blood that's been shed, because of the cross that we sang about and the Christ that hung there to be the propitiation for our sins and the sins of the whole world. You said to come humbly, but yet boldly before the throne of grace, and we'd find you. And in finding thee, we'd find that you're a very present help in the time of sickness, sorrow, and trouble. So we bring written and spoken and unspoken requests to you. We bring burdens, sons, daughters, husbands, wives, family members, and friends. Before a God that hears and answers prayer, we bring our nursing home ministry and the veterans ministry and so many, many needs. Our youth, our young people, teenagers, our kids. Help us, dear Jesus, as a church to be one that's alive, reaching through ministry those that are so desperately in spiritual needs. Touch everybody at this altar this morning. Help them to know that you're here. Do a work in their head and in their heart that lets them know it was good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And we'll give you the praise for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. As I came in my office this morning, I uh, noticed that uh, my W-2 form was laying on my desk as to what the church had financially paid the pastor this past year. And before I stuck it in my Bible, I got out the financial receipt that uh, our treasurer had given to me as to what I had gave the church financially. I wanted to make sure I didn't rob God. I wanted to make sure I didn't steal from him. And so I wanted that sheet to read 10% or more than what I made this past year. I finished signing all of the financial contribution sheets that uh, were in the church. You'll be getting yours or picking them up if you haven't. Can I challenge you? that when you file your taxes, look at what you made. Look at what you gave God. And if you didn't steal from him, praise him. If you stole from him, be ashamed of yourself. And pray and ask God to help you Get a blessing from him by putting him first. Ushers come. To take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promises. Just to know, thus saith the Lord. I want to preach this morning on the only gospel. The only gospel, there's only one. Found throughout the word of God. It's old. It's old. 
The only gospel that's been recorded in this Bible is the old gospel found in Galatians chapter 1 verses 8 and 9. Paul is proclaiming and rehearsing the truth of the gospel. And he's telling them not to be taken in, not to be fooled, not to be tricked by this newfangled stuff. Stand with me as I read that, verses 8 and 9, the first chapter. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. He's reviewing and rehearsing it. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Heavenly Father, help us to know beyond a question, beyond a shadow of a doubt, in these changing times, may we be assured of what the gospel is and receive it and appropriate and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. May God add his blessings to the reading of the word of God. We're living in a day and age where people are abandoning the old gospel. They're saying it's foolish. They're saying it is not relevant in the day and age in which we live. And they're bringing in new styles and new forms of worship. And uh, some of those things are not all bad. But you can't fool with the gospel. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby lost men and women can be saved. Let me say without apology, humanism, secularism, spiritualism is going away from God and the church and leading you down a path in which you don't want to go. I'm thankful that my dad and mom, when me and my brother were kids, were led to a holiness church where they preached the gospel. And I learned what the gospel really was. Maybe we ought to define it. I, I, I wonder if we took a poll this morning out of this big a crowd and ask every individual, walk up there when it comes your turn and define the gospel to Pastor Bauer. What would you say? What would your definition of the gospel be? Well, it should be something like this. Pastor Bauer, that old gospel is the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, and the soon return of Jesus Christ for the church. May we never forget how precious the gospel is. 
and everywhere that Paul went and, and the churches that he started and, and the young men that he mentored, he said, Timothy, whatever you do, preach the gospel, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine because, Timothy, there will come a time when they will not endure the truth and they will not want to hear the old-fashioned gospel. But they'll heap to themselves teachers that will tickle their ears and preach to them and teach them things that they want to hear. Let me define the old gospel. The reason that I believe it. The reason that I preach it. The reason that I've stuck with it down through the days and the weeks and the months and the years. Number one, it's a unique gospel. It's one of its kind. You'll never experience You'll never read. You'll never witness another gospel like the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is unequaled in its source and in its subject matter. Kings, parliaments, governments, intellectuals, Universities have tried to rid their self of the gospel, but it still lives. And it's still penetrating the minds and the hearts of people in our land and in darkest Africa. When the gospel is preached, lives are still being changed. Its origin and source come from God. Joseph Smith, Buddha, Allah, they didn't invent the gospel. God the Father gave the gospel through God the Son. And God the Son sent the gospel to you through the Holy Spirit and the written word. What are you trying to say, preacher? The gospel's unique because it gives everybody an opportunity to be saved. Some of these nice, fancy organizations blackball you if you don't meet their standards. But the gospel, regardless of who you are, how much money you may have, what side of the tracks you may live on, what kind of environment you had to endure or how you were abused as a child. The gospel gives you an opportunity to be saved from every sin and become a new creature in Christ Jesus. You're invited. It's, uh, it's unique. Though millions have come, there's still room for some. And the gospel is still inviting. Come ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And the spirit and the bride say come. And you that are thirsty come to the waters of life and drink. You that are hungry, come and eat the bread of life. It's a unique gospel in its ob observation. I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything like it of how a person could receive the gospel and lay their cigarettes down. How the al alcoholic 
can quit drinking cold turkey. How a man's marriage that was tore apart through adultery and immorality could be put back together and husband and wife could fall in love again and that marriage be restored because of the gospel. How that husband or wife could walk away from that casket in that funeral parlor knowing the gospel gives them a blessed hope that that's not the end. But one day, someday, there'll be a great and grand reunion. No other gospel could raise its founder from the dead and have him stand and declare, because I live, you shall live also. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, the fear of death and failure is gone because we know he holds the future. Life is worth the living because we see, we hear, we observe. Oh, preacher, can it be real? Oh, how well do I remember how I doubted day by day I did not know for certain that my sins were washed away. When the Spirit tried to tell me, my heart would not at first believe. But then suddenly, when I received the gospel, like sparks from smitten steel, just so quick. Salvation reach me and let me know. Thank God. Old time, Holy Ghost, heartfelt, sin killing, devil defeating, bought by the blood, Bible believing, baptized in the Holy Ghost. Salvation is real. It's real. Oh, I know it's real. Praise God. The doubts are settled for I know I know that it's real. The uniqueness of the gospel puts us, each and every one, under an obligation. You still listening? If you're listening, say amen. amen. If you're not, you don't have to say anything. I've already lost you. It puts us under an obligation to receive it or to reject it. To receive it or to refuse it. What what have you done with the gospel? It's not that you've not heard it because you have. Not once, not twice, many times over. You've heard it. You've read it. You've witnessed it. What makes a person jump up out of their seat in church and shout and run? It's the gospel. It's the gospel. Many times uh, you may have gotten nervous or didn't know what to think or, or do or believe. And you might have thought in your mind, what's the matter with that woman? It's the gospel. It's the gospel. If you get under the spout where the gospel comes out, see a lot of people don't get under that spout. But if you ever work your way under the spout where the gospel comes out, you know what's going to happen? You're going to shout and shine and testify. 
the gospel is unique. The second thing about the gospel, and I'm glad for this one too, I'm glad the gospel's different, you know. It's, it's not like uh, man-made things. It comes only from God, and uh, it cannot be duplicated. Many have tried it, but uh, it's unique in itself. But number two, it's unchanging. It's an unchanging gospel. Now, a lot of people have changed. A lot of churches have changed. A lot of preachers have changed. Someone looked at me the other day at a funeral in Kentucky. And he said, uh, Pastor Bauer, how long has it been since I've seen you? I said, probably 30 years. He said, it probably has. You're, you're gray-headed. And you've gained some weight, haven't you? And I thought to myself, well, you're not as handsome as you used to be either. I said, yeah, I've gained some weight. And I've got gray hair. You see what Brenda's done to me? He wouldn't touch that. He said, here's what I want to know. When you were our pastor for seven years, do you remember what I told you when you were leaving and going to the city? I said, you may not remember. It's been over 30 years. I said, I remember. He said, what, I, what did I tell you? I said, uh, you looked at me and said, uh, you'll change. You'll change. When you get up there, you'll change. Do you still preach the way you preach to us? I said, oh no, you guys had it easy. I, <laughs> I preach a lot harder and more in depth now. I've learned some things after 30 years. You've not changed? I said, well, if you're asking me, I think I've got worse. But ask Brenda. You know, she sat under Pastor Bauer's ministry for many a year. Ask her if she thinks I've changed in preaching the Word of God. You see, it's an unchanging gospel. Jesus said he's the same. Yes. Yesterday, today, and forever. Right. You know, they try to pawn that off on us. But don't change. Keep preaching. Yes. Keep singing. Yes. Keep loving. Yes. Keep having church on Sunday night. Yes. Keep having a midweek prayer service. Well, they won't come. Well, let them stay home. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'll be in the midst. It's an unchanging gospel. That means it changes not. Unchanging to me means it don't change. It changes not. No other gospel. Paul warned the people in those two verses twice. Not to receive or to accept any other gospel that was ever preached to them. We swallowed this modern day lukewarm gospel to the point that we have no power with God anymore. We can't get our prayers through. We can't get our political leaders elected that will tell the truth and stand for what's right. And many of them that claim the name of Christ have no clue whatsoever as to what the gospel 
of Jesus Christ is. The Lord said about the unchanging gospel, not one word will pass away. Not one jot, not one tittle, but all things written in this book will be fulfilled. I guess what he's saying is we don't need to change it or rearrange it. We need to read it, appropriate and apply it to our lives and live it just like it is. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. You'll either get saved through hearing that gospel, that old gospel, or you won't get saved at all. Let me tell you right now, love you to pieces, shaking the preacher's hand, giving him an outback card, won't get you to heaven. Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. And last of all, but not least, it's an unfailing gospel. They always told me if something wasn't broke, don't try to fix it. And if it doesn't fail, and evidently it doesn't, because the apostle said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power through faith unto salvation. Read Saul, who later became Paul. Read his life before the gospel, and then read his life after the gospel. Read the difference. Read the change. Before the gospel, he persecuted the church and Christians and killed them. After the gospel, he preached the same gospel that he fought against. The gospel not only changed Paul's life, it guided his life, the rest of his life. He was led and fed and guided by the gospel. The gospel guarded his life. They tried to kill him. They tortured him. They put him in deep seas. They stoned him. They beat him. They whipped him. They tried to kill him. And an angel from heaven said, Paul, don't worry. God's got much people in this city and he's going to protect you. Paul was preaching and teaching and warning them not to add to or to take anything away from the gospel. I don't believe this is the only church. I believe wherever the gospel's preached and you receive it, you can get to heaven. But if you've got family and friends that are going to some old dry, dead church, that's preaching anything other than the gospel. Pray them out of there and get them into a gospel preaching church where the Holy Spirit will penetrate their heart. There's only one gospel. It's the old one that's found in this book. Shall we stand? Brother Scott Hathaway, would you dismiss us in prayer?